Everybody doing good? Action Church, doing well? Hey, we're, uh, we are gonna be in Nehemiah uh, chapter two and then spend the most time studying verse by verse Nehemiah chapter four today uh, as we wrap up uh, this series. I wanna remind you, uh, if you're new with us uh, or if you just started uh, attending Action Church or you call Action Church home, we are in the middle of our expansion season where we are uh, getting ready to, to give. The second Sunday in December, every single year, we give over and above our normal tithes and offerings. And we do that because at Action Church, we exist to reach people where they are and connect them to everything God has for their life. And once a year, we expand our ability uh, to do that. Uh, last year, we raised just over a million dollars uh, above our tithes and offerings. And that one weekend, in the middle of COVID, and, it was amazing, you're such a generous church, the most gift we've ever had in the history of the church for our expansion offering. I can't wait, next week uh, I'll be uh, here uh, again and be sharing uh, some of the things that we did last year uh, through your faithful giving and then letting you know uh, a few uh, of our focuses uh, that we have uh, coming up this year for our expansion offer. We, we are building God's church, we are building the church, we are called in this season, uh, if you call this place home, to build Action Church. And so for the last three weeks, uh, we've been talking about building, and we've been using this character, Nehemiah, uh, in the Old Testament, because he was called by God to go back to Jerusalem. He was living in Persia as the cupbearer, the royal cupbearer for the king of Persia, very high in authority in the, uh, uh, the, the table of the king, very important upper class citizen. And he's called to go back and do something that doesn't make any sense, to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild a wall. I'll give you some historical context in case you're new with this. The book of Nehemiah is a continuation of the book of Ezra. And this book was compiled of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's memoirs or his, his journal, but was most likely written by Ezra, obviously inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit. The, the timeline of this book of the Bible is 445 BC, and it is actually uh, chronologically the last of the Old Testament books written. It would have been, if, you, if you're studying the Old Testament, it's much sooner uh, listed in the Old Testament, but chronologically speaking, it would have been the last times before, the silent years before the birth of Jesus. And it would have been identical, the same time, mirroring, mirroring the, uh, the prophet Malachi uh, at the end of the Old Testament. We studied that a little bit uh, week one, the, the kind of the correlation of Malachi and Nehemiah. I wanna remind you that Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem, so his passion to go back and rebuild the wall was God-given, not man-made. And, and I just, I, I want us to, I don't know where you're gonna go in your spiritual journey. I don't know if Action Church is always gonna be a part of it, but, but I just wanna submit to you that it's always better to build something that's gonna last. And it's always better to invest your time and your resource, your life into something that's bigger than you and the things of God. A God-given purpose will always be better than a man-made dream. I'm not saying God doesn't want you to have wishes and dreams and desires, no, no, but I'm saying those should be submitted to the call of God on your life because we have a, a clear mission to to reach people and to help people and to serve people, to build God's church. Nehemiah had a clear mission, to rebuild the wall. And we talked about, this is not a beautification project. Last week we talked about the 10 gates. Come on, you got an honorary doctorate last week if you came to Action Church. Like, you did. And I peaked. That's, that's, that's as much knowledge you're ever gonna get. It's all downhill from there. And so that was it. You're done. And you could go online right now. We, we actually have a website. You can go type it in and sign your own honorary doctorate in Jesus' name. You can do anything online right now, you know what I mean? You get a degree, you got a degree last week in the 10 gates. It was way funnier first service, Pastor Eddie. <laughs> they were a more fun crowd. Be better, be better. <laughs> the wall was huge. 1.8 miles in length, 40 feet tall, 8.7 feet thick. A 1,000 men over 52 days completed this wall. And sections of the wall still stand today. Thousands of years later, why? Because it was a God-given purpose that God said go and rebuild this and we build the things of God at, at last. I have some bad news. You, you okay with that today? I got some bad news to start off with. How many of you like good news first or bad news first? I always like the bad news first too. I wanna give you some, some bad news and then, and then some good news towards the end. If you and I decide to, to build this wall, to, to build the local church, to, to take a step out and say, we're gonna build it brick by brick. This is my gate. This is my section. There's gonna be opposition. What I wanna study today is how do we handle 
opposition. Nehemiah chapter four is all about the opposition that Nehemiah faced as he was building the thing that God had called him to build. Before we get to Nehemiah four, let's jump back to Nehemiah two just for a second and introduce these characters, these, these, these critics, the, the opposition to Nehemiah. Nehemiah two says, verse 19 says, when Sambalot, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite uh, official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, heard about the wall, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked? Are you rebelling against the king? Starting to already plant seeds of doubt. Nehemiah, he replied with poise and with confidence and, and projection. He answered them in the next verse. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem, nor any claim or historic right to it. See, the motivation of the opposition was exposed in this next chapter of chapter four, and that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna talk about how do we build well in the face of opposition? How do we stay faithful to what God has called us to even when it's hard, even when it hurts? Let's go to chapter four, verse one. Let's go verse by verse and study this together this morning. Sambalot was very angry when he learned they were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and he mocked the Jews, saying in front of, uh, uh, saying in front of his friends, the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they are doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? He starts with these, with these questions. He starts with this attack, and, and I wanna tell you how the opposition will always come, how the enemy will come, how people in your life used by the enemy will come, and I wanna walk step by step through what, what happened here with, uh, um, with Sambalot. Sambalot, he heard about the wall. That's important. He heard about the wall. He didn't go and see it, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. He was angered by what he heard. It's amazing how oftentimes when the, the opposition to what God is doing is, 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 is almost always emotional and never rational. And people will, will, will always settle for something that makes them feel a certain way even if it's not factual. He, he heard, then he was angered, and then he mocked what he had heard about. He mocked Nehemiah, he mocked the call, he, he mocked the, 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 the mission. The enemy... You gotta catch this. The enemy hates the truth, so he will do anything he can to twist it. He can't change it because it's truth, but he can twist it. Here's, here's how he does it. Here's how the opposition comes in to us in our lives when we're building the things of God. We're gonna build my family. I'm gonna build my business. I'm gonna build the church. I'm gonna build this calling or this purpose. Here's how it comes, verse two and three. Let's read it again. Saying in front of uh, his friends and the army officers, what does this poor bunch of feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build a wall in a single day just by making some sacrifices? Write this down if you're taking notes. It always starts with divisive questions. It always starts with these divisive questions. Are they gonna restore it for themselves? Are they gonna do it all in one day? Are they coming here to, to overthrow? This divisive attack is an attempt to make what is painfully clear somehow unclear, as though, it, as though we're cloaking or masking some vast agenda. What the Jews were doing was building a wall. Nehemiah had one goal, build the wall. They're asking all of these questions, these divisive questions to distract and to create all, well, what are they doing? Are they, are they gonna overthrow the king? Are they building an army? What is going on? No, they just came to build the wall, simple. Not new taxation, not new things, but it's an effective strategy because it's done with questions. Come on, you've been there before. You're talking to somebody and they, they just ask a lot of questions. Never offer any conclusions so that the attacker cannot be tagged with any actual accusation. They just, I'm just asking questions. Sharing feelings, suggestions, ideas, and questions. The opposition, Sambalad, his friends, the opposition in our life, the critics, and 
our life will ask questions, but never with the intent of finding any actual answers. Questions are good. Creators ask questions to learn, to grow, to seek real answers. The enemy always starts with divisive questions. Making something that is so clear, unclear. And it gets us, it gets us distracted. That's the next one. Here's the next one. Which leads, so it starts with divisive questions, then it leads to attacking of the values. The next thing they do here in verse two and three is they say, can they offer sacrifices? Did you come back here to offer sacrifices? They're mocking their religion. They're mocking their, their values. They're, they're, they're mocking what's going on here. And they're moving the discussion to be about something else. They're, they're, they're noting the, the religious side of the Jewish people that are different than everybody else. And what they're doing is they're, they're diverting the attention. The goal was clear, so they're divisive first. The next one is a distraction away from the obvious. Have you ever been in an argument with somebody, it's so popular now in 2021, and they use what, a, a circular reasoning or that what about logic? Like, well, you, you know, well, what about this? And he was like, no, I just came here to build a wall. But they're like, yeah, what about the sacrifices? He's like, what, what are you talking about sacrifices? I'm building a wall. You ever been in an argument with somebody and you're solving one problem and then all they do once you start solving that problem is bring up another problem? Nobody? Are you buried, is your head buried in the sand in 2021? That's all we do. Well, we're gonna fix it. Well, what about this? Well, hold on. We're still working on this. Give us a minute, let us take a few steps. We'll get there in a little while. We, it's a distraction with divisive questions and attacking the values of what's going on, the simplicity of what's going on. It's, it's a diversion. What about? Well, I can't solve all the what abouts until I focus on the first thing we started. You know you've won the argument when they no longer are participating in the argument, they're just trying to create a new argument. It's over. That and name calling, you win. Just count it up, just check it out. Yep, see ya. It continues, get this next one, it continues. It continues with planting seeds of doubt. He says, are, are you gonna finish this in one day? Well, obviously not. It's 1.8 miles in length, 40 feet tall, 8.7 feet thick. We're not gonna finish it in a day. And the enemy, the opposition, the critics, they will always try and make the task too big, to handle, and if we get overwhelmed with the enormity of it, we'll never start. That's why this series is called Brick by Brick. Not section by section, not gate by gate, not wall by wall, not whole project. Just one faithful step at a time. The problem is too big will always keep you from starting to solve it. It's one of the greatest tools of the enemy. This is too big. Nobody could ever change it. No, but you can start brick by brick, person by person, conversation by conversation. What the enemy does lastly, when all else fails, we see Tobias there, when all else fails, it ends with sarcastic redirection. He says, hey, if a fox jumped on these stones, it would crumble, which is ridiculous to say, but that's at the end of the day, when the opposition, when the people, when the critics, they can't get at you with it, then they'll just have a sarcastic redirection to a new thing. They'll rely on making fun of you or comedy or tearing you down because there's no longer any logical point to make. I wanna go back just for a second. It says, when these men, when they heard in chapter two, when they learned in chapter four. They had never actually even been to the, what does it say when they saw what Nehemiah was doing? It doesn't say when they visited. It doesn't say when they worked. They heard. People always like to connect dots of assumption rather than actual facts. They heard it. They learned about it. They weren't even there. Like they, they didn't have an architecture background. They weren't experts in stone and rebuilding. And they just heard some things and then started trying to tear down the thing that God was doing. Just creating these rumors. Hey, here's what the people of God are doing. Hey, here's what I heard. Be very careful, church, repeating 
what you heard out of an assumption when there's no actual facts to validate it. Because what I've learned is lies are loud. They're ugly and they're hurtful. What I've also found is that lies don't last nearly as long as truth. And that we can't come down or be distracted by these divisive questions and these seeds of doubt because truth wins and we're not building something that falls away, we're building something that will last. I wanna be very clear as well. Questions, questions are a great thing from within the context of relationship, family, and what God is building. If you are on the wall or in our context in the church, questions are great, concerns are great, feedback is great, confrontation is great. That's how you actually get better. It's never about not building the right way or in a new way or in a different way. It's about keeping people from tearing down the very thing that God is building. If you're... T- How in the world can we build what God is calling us to build, the the wall figuratively, the church practically, if all we're doing is tearing it down? You cannot deconstruct the church and build the church at the same time. It's not possible. I'm just being simple. You can't tear something down and build it at the same time. They are counterintuitive. They go against each other. And just for me personally, I'd rather be found building the only thing that God is building than tearing it down. Let's keep reading chapter four, verse four. Thank you, Pastor Eddie. (laughs) Then I prayed, hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At least the wall, or at last the wall, uh, was completed to half its height around the entire city. For the people had worked with enthusiasm. I want to I want to show you something. I want to show you how to handle it. We we just talked about what's going to happen, how the enemy, how the opposition is going to come against us. I want to show you how to handle it. You ready? We need to recognize that Nehemiah didn't answer the men, didn't answer the opposition, didn't answer the people. He turned his frustration to prayer. He did not even obliged them with a conversation because he knew it was a waste of time. He just took it to go. And he was open, first and foremost with God, concerning the the opposition, concerning the fight. And I need you to catch this today. Come on to all of our locations. Criticism, opposition should be first met with prayer. Don't act like what's happening to you doesn't hurt. It does. But take the hurt to God. He can handle it. You're not wrong for pouring out your frustration with God. You can tell God anything. Come on, sometimes I just tell God, I wanna punch him in the face but not like a jab, like a full crow hop, just a full, like, just, I want to destroy you. (laughs) Like facial reconstruction. You can't do that. That's assault. You're going to go to jail. But you can tell God, God, I want to kill him. God, I'm hurting. God, I'm in anguish. Whatever it is, he will correct your heart but I urge you not to hide your heart from him. He can handle it. Intimacy with God, intimacy with God is about honesty before God. And praying this prayer of honesty and intimacy and authenticity, saying, God, I just don't know what to do. Help me. Don't take it to the opposition. Don't even take it to people first. Take it, take it to God. Let's look at the details really quick at Nehemiah's prayer. I wanna give give you just five quick things from here. Nehemiah's prayer. Nehemiah asked God to hear the pain of the people. God, listen. God, pay attention. Do you notice what we're going through? We've been faithful. We're doing what you called us to. Just, just, Just hear the pain. Nehemiah asked God to turn their criticism and sarcasm on them. 
That sounds fun. I'm going to pray that later. <laughs> that wasn't funny first service either. I guess it's offensive. <laughs> it's okay. You're talking to God. It's fine. He can handle it. He, can, he knows. You know what's crazy? I've said this before. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing's ever occurred to God? And that you telling him how you feel is not news to him? You're like, I don't want to say that. If you're thinking it, he's in there. <laughs> Nehemiah asked God not to let them get away with it. Here's the fourth one. Let's camp out here for a second. Nehemiah acknowledged the effect the attack had on him. We feel despised. They've demoralized us. To take it to God, that's our first spiritual step. Let's get practical for a second. How do we actually handle this? We're, we're building the things. Maybe, maybe you started giving, you started serving, you, you gave your life to Jesus, you're acting different in your school or in your workplace or in your family, and you, you've got some criticism, you've got some opposition, you've got some people tearing you down. Well, take it to God. We just talked about that. But, but, but what's next? You gotta get that out of you. I want to give you something really practical I gave to our staff this week. Take it to God and then take it to your notes app on your phone. Write out everything you would say to them. Everything. And then don't send it. <laughs> don't allow a critic who is critical of you turn you into a critic who is critical of them. If we respond the same way, we're no different. People aren't the enemy. The enemy is the enemy and he uses people. People are the point. Jesus died for people. No matter how ugly they are to you, the Bible is very clear. Stay consistent. How do we do that? I don't know about you. I gotta say it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're holier than me. If you're holier than me, take out the second step. Maybe you can just take it to God, but your pastor is not that holy. I gotta take it to God and then I got to get it out of me. Then I gotta let somebody know about it. Take it to God, take it to your notes app, take it to a mentor, a spiritual authority, somebody you trust, and then move on. Move on. The wall still has to be built. Here's the fifth thing Nehemiah did in his prayer is he kept the people working. They stayed on the wall. Notice they didn't, they didn't pray instead of working they prayed while they were still working. We're gonna read about it in just a moment. These men were on the wall and it said they had a sword in one hand and a hammer. They had their tools in the other. The point of, of God sending Nehemiah was to build the wall and nothing else. The point of the local church is to go into the world and reach people for Jesus. Go into the world preaching the gospel making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's really simple what we're called to do. We're called to build. We're called to pray and fight because our fight is not against flesh and blood. This sword that's in our hand is not used for people. That's murder. We talked about that in the Ten Commandments. The sword is figuratively saying, hey, we're gonna fight a spiritual battle and we're practically gonna build what God is calling us to build. And when I'm holding my sword, the authority of God and the word of God, and I'm doing what he's called me to do, I don't have time to come down and talk to you about whatever you're talking about. I would, I'd love to, I wish. I wish I had enough time to sit around and think about and make up all the stuff that you're making up. I wish I didn't have a, a, a job or a purpose. I wish I could just do that with my whole life, but I've been sent here on a mission and my hands are too full to come down. I'm not gonna be distracted. I'm not gonna be divided. I'm not gonna be moved from this place on this. Wow, they just kept working. The enemy can't destroy you, he'll distract you, and I'm just here to ask you today, just keep building. The opposition is not gonna go away. Nehemiah had it. Jesus said, they hate me, so they'll hate you. I've read the end of the book. It's, it's good news for us. We win, but the way we get there is not very fun. The world's not getting better. You say, if I just get through this, Attack, if I just handle this one, there's gonna be another one. Just fill in the blank with a new name, a new season, a new question, a new thing. It's gonna happen in your life. You know how you defeat it? Just stay right here. 
Just keep building what God is building. We'll read about it in just a moment. I'm getting way ahead of myself. I got excited. But it says, if we keep doing what we're doing, it says, when we call on God, he will fight for us. You know how he'll know where you are? Because you're right where he left you, building the wall. Just right there. Building your section, building your gate, doing what God has called you to do. Let's read verse 7 through 12. Got super excited back there. I'm sweaty. You shouldn't, shouldn't preach in a sweatshirt. Just never do that. No matter what temperature is out there, it's always not that in here. And I'm literally, I'm, it's like a, like a weight loss program up here right now. <sighs> I think it was the crow hop punch that got me. Or maybe the yelling without breathing for the last minute and a half. <laughs> it's my oxygen. Verse seven. But when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabs, the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard about the work that was going ahead, that the, the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired. See, they started criticizing, they started attacking, they thought they would stop, but then they were discouraged because all of the gaps were, were, were being repaired. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and we guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. It's always and, spiritual and practical. They didn't just go to their house and pray, they prayed while they stood guard, while they worked, while they were prepared. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. They tried to tear down the mission. They can't do that. The enemy can't do that. The Bible's very clear. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. They will try and tear down the mission of the church. They will try and tear down its influence. The world will do that. People will do that. They can't. They tried to tear down the materials. They talked about the stones being rubble and scorched and burned. And they will do that to you. They will talk about your past. They will talk about the ruins. They will talk about what happened. They will talk about all the gaps and the holes that need to be buried, that it's too big, that you cannot be saved, that you cannot be redeemed. And I just need to remind somebody today that Jesus died. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's where grace steps in. I need you to know they will try and tear down the materials of your life and the mistakes that you've made. And I'm just here to tell you there is nothing you could ever say or do that's beyond repair. That God redeemed you, he can repair you, and he can repurpose you for his glory. The materials, you have all you need to accomplish what God is calling you to accomplish. Your past got you to this point, and if you give it to God, it can be redeemed and repurposed for your future. They tried to tear down the mission. They tried to tear down the materials. The last thing they tried to, they tried to tear down the people, the morale. How'd they do it? Rumors from within. Go back to verse 12. The enemy, the insults, the attacks, the distraction cannot tear down the wall unless it gets inside. Meanwhile, our enemy's saying, before they know what will happen, we'll swoop down and kill them. Check this, verse 12. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again. I wanna ask you who you're listening to today. How close are you living to the enemy? Where are you getting your news, your thoughts, your ideas, your perspective, your worldview, where are you getting everything that you're talking about? Is it from the word of God and from the people of God or is it from, some of you need to move back a little bit closer to the things of God. You need to stop focusing on what you've heard and start, start focusing on what he said. And say, I'm not gonna bring that stuff in. And here's the question, why? Are they saying that? Why are you listening? And why are they comfortable talking to you about it? it? Can't be destroyed from the outside. The wall's already half built. It's 20 feet tall by now. A few men with a plot are not gonna tear it down, but they knew 
if they got lies inside of the people of God, the fear would stop them and they could stop the work from the inside that could never be stopped from the outside. So here's all I'm asking as a church is let's make sure we are building our life on the truth and on healthy relationships. And from that place, catch this, not living outside the walls, but going outside the walls to bring people back in. It's not where we live and where we stay, but it is where we go and we reach and we connect and we love and we serve. And we do try and bring as many people back in, but we can't live that far from the things of God and the people of God. Verse 13, so I placed armed guards, let's finish the chapter. I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by their families, armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember our Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand, supporting their load with one hand while they're holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeters stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, the work is very spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is, then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset and half the men were always on guard. We'll, we'll stop there for the sake of time. They, they began to complete the wall. I don't know if you've caught this, but we're, we're, we have no plans at Action Church to build a wall. <laughs> but we are called to build a church. And the mission is clear that we're called to go. The mission is not changing, that we are going to reach and connect people. But the church isn't built by attendees, consumers, and good intentions. It's not a spectator sport. The thing we're building, the local church, and in this season, our local expression of Action Church, this thing we're building, it's birthed in prayer. There's a sword in our hand. It is a spiritual battle. You will never win a spiritual battle fighting it with worldly tactics. That's why we take it to God. It is birthed in prayer. The thing we're building is birthed in time with God and His presence and His power. It's built with sacrifice. You gotta have a hammer. The wall's not gonna build itself. I don't know why, but God chose to use people, broken humanity, to accomplish his purpose, which means we need more of him, but we need a hammer, we need a shovel, we need a tool belt, we need to get to work. It's both and. It's birthed in prayer, it's built with sacrifice, and it's finished through Jesus. wrestled with how to finish this series with Nehemiah 4. To go through the next few chapters, they finish the wall and we have the dimensions. What was fascinating to me is that every ruler after Nehemiah expanded the wall. The, the wall was bigger with every generation because each new king kept expanding the wall. So I feel like God gave me this picture today. The wall looks pretty good. I mean, it looks like it's in a three-year-old classroom, but you kind of get the point, right? Like, like it's, it's good. And if we're not careful, we value excellence here at Action Church, and we have an amazing A-team, thousands of you that serve, and a phenomenal staff. If you're not careful, you, you come in and you think, wall looks pretty good. What would I do? There's no more bricks to be laid, but I feel like God gave me this picture today that there's always, there's always more bricks. So I brought you a wheelbarrow today. I brought you some, some new material. You're right, we've already done all that we can do with the old material. We're gonna celebrate what God did last year in the expansion offering. We're gonna celebrate what God did last year in the Christmas store. We're gonna celebrate 3,833 lives that have just been given to Jesus this year, just this year. Phenomenal, 
grateful, so grateful. But we're done getting credit for that. That wall's already built. We got some new people, some new bricks. We got to build higher. And then we got to start adding to the wall. Like there's new sections that need to be built. And here's the deal, they can't be built without your time, without your talent, without your resources. There are things that you were put on this earth to do. There are new gates, come on. There are new sections. There are new things that only you can do. And yeah, we'll be fine. The old wall was great, it was good. If we wanted to just take care of the same amount of people in the same circumference, 1.8 miles, yeah, we could do that. And that's where most churches stop. This feels good. We have multiple services. We can take care of everybody. No, there are more people outside the walls. And the same way they went into that ravine last week and they dug in that tough ground, that new fountain, that new spring to bring what was outside into the inside is the same thing that you and I have to do. If we're not careful, we'll sit comfortable behind a wall that we built and we'll say, look at what God did. And I'm here to ask you today, what could God do if you and I decided we're gonna keep building and keep expanding and keep going? What's the section you're called to build? What's the brick you're called to lay? And let's start doing it. Birthed in prayer built with sacrifice, initiated and finished by Jesus Christ himself. Let's build our lives in the only thing that Jesus is building and returning for. And let's build our lives expanding its influence with each brick, each season, each step, and let's build together something that will last for eternity you bow your head, say every head bowed, every eye closed. God, we love you. Thank you for your word today in Nehemiah chapter four. Pray that it would change us. Church, every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to meet Jesus today. We've talked a lot the last three weeks about what we can do together to build what he is building, but we say it all the time at Action Church, you can't give something away that you don't possess and you can't start building until first you've allowed Jesus to build something on the inside of you. That's a relationship with him. I talked around it today, but Jesus lived for you. He died as you, he's resurrected to give you victory. What do I mean by that? His life was perfect because you and I are not. His death was a substitution for our mistakes and his resurrection gives us access to victory. The Bible's very clear in Romans that we have a responsibility and that responsibility is to surrender and say, God, have your way in my life. I give you control. If you wanna do that today, you wanna surrender your life, you wanna start building the things of God, it starts by first inviting Jesus to be the Lord of your life, to start that real relationship with him. If you wanna do that, I wanna pray with you. For some of you, for the first time ever, others of you, today's more of a day of recommitment. So I, I'm getting my life right, I'm coming back into a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, and you know today is your day of salvation, or today is your day of, of recommitment. Would you raise your hand right where you are and say, I need Jesus in my life. You make him the Lord of my life. I got one, two, three, four, one, five, six, seven over here, several more in the stadium. Sanford and South, Oviedo, online, proud of you. Best decision you could ever make in your life. Put your hands down. Would you pray this in your hearts? I pray it out loud, say this. Say, God, I love you. God, I thank you for saving me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I'm saved only by your grace. And I am confessing with my mouth and I'm believing in my heart that you are the Lord giving you that place today. Complete and total control. God, have your way in my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And God, I pray for all of us. Call Action Church home. Pray in this season we, we would seek you intently. And Holy Spirit, give us clarity for our next steps, our section, our gate, our role. Give us a God-given purpose and then give us the faith and the boldness to walk it out. We love you. We praise you in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. And amen, church, can we celebrate all the decisions? Come on, really celebrate them. We're so proud of you.